The way we understand our planet depends on the way we look at it. And if we look at it through different types of lens, and if we share different perspectives, we can gain a better understanding. And one of the most powerful perspectives to study our planet is the one we get from space, because we look at us from outside. And this is a picture of the Earth as seen from space, but through the rings of Saturn. Can you see it? Maybe I need to zoom in, because this is us, all of us, right there. 7.5 billion people living on this little pale blue dot, suspended in the infinity of space. And from that perspective, you understand how tiny we are, how isolated, but also how fragile is our planet. This picture was taken by the Cassini spacecraft after seven years of an uh, epic journey to Saturn, and it was taken on, taken on a special day, the 19th of July 2013, because on that day there was a solar eclipse from the point of view of the satellite, which enabled the camera on board to take this beautiful picture of the rings of Saturn, but also to capture the faint light of the Earth reflected in the background. And this day was called the day the Earth smile, because it was the first time in history, actually, that people on the planet were informed that their picture was taken from so far away. So they were invited to stop working, go outside, wave at Saturn, and smile, just being grateful that by a strange chemical reaction, they were alive on this planet to witness this. So if you miss these events, I would like to give you a, another chance and to celebrate the fact that we are here today together to share ideas by waving at your neighbor and smiling for one second with me. <laughs> Thanks. So this picture is actually the first ever selfie taken across the whole solar system uh, with a stick of 1.4 billion kilometer. And what I find most remarkable about it is that it really captures our spirit as a species of scientific explorer, our curiosity to build technology to explore the universe, to go very far away and ultimately look back at us to understand who we are and how we fit into this system. So if I zoom in and arrive to the moon, you see that this pale blue dot is actually a strikingly beautiful and colorful planet. In fact, it's always a, a moving experience to look at the planet as a whole like this because you have this sense of unity and beauty. You don't see any frontiers from there. And you can think of this planet as a water planet. Water is basically everywhere. It's mainly blue because you have water in the ocean, which covers three quarters of the planet, but it's also a bit white because you have water in the clouds, in the atmosphere, condensed, or frozen onto the ice. So water is a key building element of life, and still it's limited. If you put all the water on Earth together, only 2.5% of this water is fresh water and we can only access a very small fraction of it. So to make the most of this space view, space agencies around the world have been deploying a fleet of satellites to monitor the planet over the last decades. And Europe has played a key role in this, a uh, key leadership role by building the most comprehensive observing system ever for the environment called Copernicus, which includes a family of Sentinel missions. And from the, from the point of view of these uh, missions, our Earth is also green, pointing to signs of life. In fact, what you see here is the impact of photosynthesis, the most important chemical reaction for life. And although it operates at microscopic level, you can see the large-scale effect from space. And missions like Sentinel-3 can capture the uh, global content of chlorophyll, both coming from the ocean with tiny animals called uh, plankton that are blooming and creating life, or on land, monitoring the extent and health of vegetation. Now, if you take a lens that enables you to see during the night, you actually see that there is another type of life, which is us, with a global footprint on the environment, in particular on energy. The brightest spots here correspond to cities, and as half of uh, the human race is actually living in cities today. 
And these cities keep growing, some of them uh, becoming mega cities, and most of them growing in the coastal region. So we become a coastal species as well. And by looking at this, you understand that by having 7.5 billion people on the planet and being committed to 9 billion, we have a massive impact on it. So now if you take gravity lens, you see the real physical shape of the Earth. So from the gravity point of view, the Earth is not a sphere, but a big potato, like this. And this surface is called the geoid. It has been measured by a satellite called Goche within an incredible accuracy. This satellite is also called the Ferrari of space because of its shape. It has wings because it flies actually very low in the atmosphere to measure subtle variation of gravitation. So when I showed that to my daughters, uh, Katya and Olga, they, they couldn't believe uh, the ocean was bumpy because when they go to the beach, they see uh, that the sea is flat, actually. And I tried to explain that uh, from the point of view of gravity, it depends on the mass you have and also of the motion of this mass through water, tectonic plates, etc., which explains why the ocean is bumpy. But they couldn't care less. In fact, after several hours, we concluded that when you go to the beach, you don't need to care about the view of gravity. You can just enjoy and have fun. But this kind of data is not only useful for science, but you have it, all of you, in your mobile phone, because it's the basis for good positioning of the GPS. Now, if you take a magnetic lens, you see that this big potato is also a big magnet. And this magnetic field is protecting us from uh, harmful radiation and solar winds. So it enables life as well. And missions like SWARM enable scientists to probe directly into the core of our planet below the rock and to see the motion of the magma. In fact, they discover a jet stream, which is an acceleration of the magma. And this was a big surprise but it enables them to better understand the variation of this magnetic field. So now if you take lenses that goes across the whole electromagnetic spectrum, beyond what we can see with the eye, you start understanding how the ocean, land and atmosphere interact as part of an integrated system that forms our climate. This is just an example of what you see with microwave lenses. You can see the humidity of the soil, and this data is useful for farmers, for example, to understand the stress on the crops. But you can also see the water in the atmosphere with clouds. So you see how it moves from the ground to the atmosphere. And you understand their climate impact because the clouds are reflecting solar radiation. If you put now infrared glasses on, you start sensing the energy. And this is really the heart of climate. The ocean is the heat engine bringing the warm water from the equator to the poles. And this kind of data shows you how global warming is. You can quantify it. In fact, last year was one of the warmest years in the record. This. And some of this heat is uh, expanding the ocean so that the sea level is rising. There are other reasons as well. But by combining the knowledge of the geoid with the lenses of a radar, we can measure sea level within millimeter accuracy from space. And we have seen that it's uh, expanding globally by a few millimeters per year. But this expansion is not uniform, as you can see here. There are big patterns like El Nino and La Nina. And this data is really useful for uh, policymakers to understand how to do climate change adaptation in the coastal ocean. You can also see the Earth breathing by looking at uh, carbon dioxide. You have here the cycle, and you see this is the breathing, with uh, the vegetation releasing carbon and then capturing carbon with the solar uh, cycles at seasonal scale. But you also see an upward trend, and this is us. This is us releasing a lot of carbon at an incredible rate to reach up to 400 parts per million, which is a concentration we didn't get since millions of years on this planet. We can also see our footprint on the lower atmosphere in the chemistry, because we release a lot of gas by combustion. This one is a nitrogen dioxide. It's a proxy for pollution. And I remember that when we released the first global picture of this, showing that pollution was moving around the world, and we put the title Transboundary Pollution we had some uh, comments from uh, some communication offices in Europe. So we changed it to economic development uh, around the globe. 
because it's quite related. It's just to show you that the same thing can be seen with different perspective, according to who you are. But the most powerful aspects of this is the combination of perspective. It's like being dealing a big picture from different pieces of the puzzle. And the problem here is that we are part of this puzzle. We are part of the geophysical experiments we are creating. So we don't have the lid where we see the big picture. So we have to integrate as many perspectives as possible to understand what's happening. And this includes also data from drones, from airplanes, but also from boys within the ocean or glider below the sea ice, but also numerical model that scientists are building, capturing the equations of dynamics of the system, but also the impact of our activity, because we are part of the equations now. And when you bring all these perspectives together, you build a kind of digital world that you can use as a laboratory. You can look into the past, what happened, what was the impact, and also predict uh, what will be the impact in the future. So it's a real tool for management. But it's not only useful for science, this kind of tool, but it's the foundation of decision making. But to do that, you need to transform this kind of data into information, indicator, and knowledge that connects directly to the user. And this is a long process. And to get into this process, you again need to change perspective and look at the data from the point of view of the users. You understand its problem, the way he thinks, how he uses data, etc. And once you do that, and you can go through this value chain, the field of application is just immense. It can go from the management of energy to the management of forest, also for supporting policy like uh, the monitoring of sustainable development goals that have been agreed uh, recently by more than 190 nations around the world to actually quantify our path towards sustainability, protect our planet, and ensure prosperity for all. This is just an example of a platform we are building using Sentinel-2 data. You can go all over in the world by just putting the name of a city. I took Cluj. And you can look at different perspectives by mixing the bands. So this is the optical view. Then you can get uh, the urban area by doing a few clicks. You can look at the vegetation, which enables you to manage uh, crops, forests, etc. And you can look also on the water stress on the city. I now invite you to take a step back, a step of 1.4 billion kilometers, to look at this view from Cassini. And Cassini is now preparing to end this mission by diving into the rings of Saturn, after 20 years of service and after landing a probe on one of the moons of Saturn called Titan. But one of the legacy of the mission is this perspective of the solar system. And when you look at that, you see that we are really modest in the universe. But we are also really unique. In fact, we have won at the planetary lottery, in a sense, because we have a climate that enables you to have a range of temperature which, at turn, enable life. So we are the only one which managed to team up with life. This is not the case of our sister Venus, which is too hot or Mars, uh, which is too cold. So when you look at this, you can understand our role as planetary guardian. This is very clear from that picture. We need to protect and cherish the planet, as Carl Sagan said. So we are becoming a kind of new force on this planet, a new geological force. And we need to figure out how to use this force, the right side of this force. And you don't need to become a Jedi to do that. You need to gain more knowledge about how this planet works, how our climate works, what is the magnetic field, but also knowledge about ourselves. And to do that, I want to leave you with a final perspective that you can discuss with our, your children when you come back home tonight. It's the perspective of the little prince. So he was with me when I was a kid and he has always been with me. I keep reading his book every three years. And I recently read it with my daughters, Katya and Olga. And I realized that he is the perfect metaphor for scientific exploration. In fact, 
is driven by curiosity. He's traveling very far away from his place, like Cassini does, gathering data, exchanging perspective with people to ultimately gain a better understanding of his planet, but also a better appreciation of his planet and his roles. And one of my favorite characters in there is the fox, because my grandfather used to tell me stories about this fox, and I'm now telling stories to my daughter about the fox. And at some point, the fox asked the little prince to be adopted, meaning to build a special relationship with him so that he becomes unique as the rose is. And the fox reminds the little prince that by doing this, he also gained a new responsibility to look after him. So we need to learn to build this special and unique relationship with our planet. We are now changing the planet at the global scale, and we are the first species who knows that it's doing this. And we can make choices, so we have a, a tremendous responsibility there. So we have to learn to become a planetary guardian, as the little prince is doing by cleaning his volcanoes every day and protecting his rose. But to do that, we need again to change perspective and to look at a very long-term perspective to visualize the future we want to create, not only the one we want to avoid. And I believe that we can build this vision together by sharing each of us our own local perspective and connecting it to the global view from space so that we see ourselves as collaborators between us, but also with the next generation to build the future we want. Thank you.